I often tell the story of being a seven-year-old and realizing that my mother was going to die. And that really tore me up for weeks. I couldn't, you know, stop bursting into tears um, until I realized that I too was going to die. And that that felt way more mysterious to me. And I didn't have the words for it, but at the time as a seven-year-old, that kind of put me on the the path to um, leading a philosophical life. Uh, But, you know, as I've aged, um, obviously I am getting closer to death. I mean, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen, you know, in 50 years, but nonetheless, as one ages, it becomes more and more of a live question, as it were. Hey everyone, welcome to this conversation that I had with Professor Matthew David Siegel, the author of this book, Crossing the Threshold, but more publicly, perhaps known as the founder or the creator of the Footnotes to Plato platform slash blog, uh, which I've been following for years, and it's superlative. Uh, it was a riveting dialogue, and I've got to admit, I was a bit starstruck at first. I still am, because, yeah, I think since I started studying philosophy and taking it more seriously, Matthew was one of the first people that I started following and using his content as an educational resource. So it was kind of surreal, really, talking to him uh, and discussing and asking him questions uh, more from the thinkers that I've been more inspired by, uh, such as Zizek and Adrian Johnston and Peter Rollins, uh, which, in fact, uh, Matthew was kind enough to say that he'll be happy to dialogue with, uh, be in dialogue with Peter uh, in the future, which I'll try and organize. Uh, but putting all that aside, of course, Matthew even though he's a German idealist, Schellingian thinker, he's also known better as a process philosopher, a Whiteheadian scholar. Uh, and it was really interesting getting into more of Whitehead's work. He's more post-Kantian process philosophy that he perhaps outlined most comprehensively in his magnum opus, one could say, uh, Process and Reality, where he kind of describes a, a relational ontology. But we shall get into that in the podcast. Uh, But without further ado, a bit of a, um, let's say, formal introduction. Professor Matthew David Siegel is a transdisciplinary researcher, writer, and philosopher applying process relational thought across the natural and social sciences, as well as in the study of consciousness. He is the associate professor in the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, CA and the chair of the Science Advisory Committee for the Cobb Institute. Professor Siegel, or pardon me, I believe it's pronounced Segal, has authored many books, including Crossing the Threshold, Etheric Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead, and is the creator of Footnotes to Plato. Having said that, without further ado, here's my conversation with Professor Matthew David Segal. Matthew, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for being here. Um, the first question probably would be uh, in the past couple of years, uh, what metaphysical questions have you been dealing with or perhaps even struggling with uh, as a philosopher? Hmm. Well, I think uh, the question that started me on the philosophical path and the one that I can't seem to get away from is that of death. Um, and human um, human destiny in the longer term sense of you know beyond just the life uh, that we lead between birth uh, and the death of this body. Um, I think that this is a question that uh, in our secular age is easy to dismiss, and many people who are not um, of any kind of religious persuasion. Um, or not spiritual in any way and just, you know, study biology and uh, study sociology from a more or less materialist perspective would just um, say, look, when you die, the lights go out and that's it. Um, And I think that actually that type of response doesn't at all do justice to the existential quandary that human beings find themselves in as, as animals aware of their death. Um, And in fact, even while the sort of superficial words that people will mouth about not feeling like it matters that we die, that we'll just make the best of it while you're alive, whatever the basic kind of, you know, physicalist uh, or materialist story about the meaning of human life as something we make up um, and, and that when you die, that's it. I think that that's actually a subtle form of death denial itself because nobody 
can deny that when a loved one dies or when they receive a terminal illness with a few notable exceptions um, that certain emotions well up where all of a sudden the entirety of your life is put in a totally different context and you start to reevaluate um, you know everything and so this question I don't think can be so easily dismissed and I don't believe that it's adequate to say um, that we can still lead a meaningful life if it is simply the end and, the, and it just goes black and it's so we never existed. Um, I think we need to be able to take seriously uh, the, the way in which meaning itself and the purpose of life itself kind of radiates out or emanates out from our, our confrontation with death. Um, and so that continues to be in the background of a lot of my philosophical work, even if I'm not explicitly addressing it and everything that I do. Um, and, you know, while I often tell the story of being a seven-year-old and realizing that my mother was going to die and that really tore me up for weeks, I couldn't, you know, stop bursting into tears um, until I realized that I too was going to die and that that felt way more mysterious to me. And I didn't have the words for it, but at the time as a seven-year-old, that kind of put me on the, the path to um, leading a philosophical life. Uh, but, you know, as I've aged, um, obviously I am getting closer to death. I mean, that could happen tomorrow, could happen, you know, in 50 years, but nonetheless, as one ages, it becomes more and more of a live question as it were. Um, so yeah, death is a big one, um, but that's not all I think about. Uh, I also, you know, think about deep cosmological questions, the origin of the universe, um, the origin of order uh, in the universe. Um, you know, I, I've done some work on um, the nature of time and the extent to which uh, contemporary physics leaves any room for time as, as a sort of lived phenomenological reality that has a direction. Um, because, you know, as many people will know, both in quantum and relativity theories, it doesn't really matter which direction time goes. It's sort of irrelevant. In thermodynamics, it's a little different. But um, so that's a big question for me, these cosmological questions. And, you know, I also um, think a lot about human uh, social organization and how to address some of the intensifying political conflicts that we're facing, um, geopolitical and internal to the United States where I live. Um, things of, you know, in my 38 years of life uh, now, um, it, taking a turn for the worse. I mean, I know that US history has had um, moments of tremendous crisis before and so in some ways, this is nothing new, but it does seem like things are boiling over at the moment, but also geopolitically. I mean, obviously there's several, at least two major wars and other, you know, skirmishes um, ongoing and they neither show any signs of um, wrapping up uh, in a peaceful, peaceful way. And so I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the future of uh, how we organize economically and how we um, can, can foster, um, an educational um, mode of existence for human beings, not just for children, but as a sort of lifelong process of, of learning. Um, I think that that's originally what universities um, were intended to foster is the sense that, you know, we continue to learn well into adulthood and that it's not just, um, you know, educational institutions don't exist simply to prepare people for the workforce um that there's a deeper calling at play there and so anyways that's a lot but i i tend to be very transdisciplinary and so i i uh i jump all over the place um in my work because it's all connected right <laughs> oh most certainly oh that i don't know but at least it all does matter in some sense uh but now as you, as you did uh mention a bit before your book certainly dives into many disciplines, which is something I really enjoy reading. Um, although uh, you did mention this in a previous episode, uh, well, not this podcast, obviously, but another podcast uh, that, and, 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 and I did get the same feeling when reading uh, Crossing the Threshold, that it's a deeply 
religious or even spiritual book? Are you certainly aren't evangelizing for any faith in particular, not even Christianity per se, even though obviously given you're writing mostly about Schelling and Whitehead Christianity, it, it's a it's it's a big part of their uh, ontology, let's say. But uh, apropos death and the, the these questions of the fact that we are human beings, we in a, in a very unique sense are animals aware of our own death or demise, to use a Heideggerian term. Uh, what what role do you think um, religion, the sacred spirituality? or even God in the monotheistic sense uh, has to play uh, in in regard to that question. And then also in the epilogue, uh, you, you make a really interesting point. You say that we need something called a sacred secularity. Um, so I'm wondering if you could kind of expound on what you meant by a sacred secularity uh, and then maybe connect that to your this initial concern with the question of death. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I want to go to um, a thinker, uh, Hans Jonas, um, to, to frame my response to this question. He, Hans Jonas wrote about Gnosticism, but he also wrote about um, the life sciences. Uh, he wrote a great book called The Phenomenon of Life that's been influential uh, on me. And he points out that historically, um, when homo sapiens are sort of first emerging, the evidence that we can point to to say, oh, okay, this is evidence that that the human is being um, is beginning to emerge is that you, you start to see funeral rites, evidence of, of, of burying the dead with belongings that suggest that there's some sense that they might live on. And he says that for this primal consciousness, um, the question, the main question for human societies across all continents was basically, what is death? Because they looked around them and perceived an animate cosmos. In other words, that, that the natural world was ensouled um, and that life was sort of the, uh, the rule rather than the exception. Um, and so the question, what is death, was the sort of origins of, of religion um for our species and spirituality and and you know this this climaxes in um you know ancient egypt where they're you know building these these gargantuan uh, pyramid structures um to help you know pharaohs pass into the afterlife in an appropriate manner and um did horrific things like you know would would include uh, all of the um servants of the, the pharaoh in the chamber while while they were still alive, you know, because the pharaoh is going to need them. <laughs> um, and there wasn't really this sense that the death of the body was the death of the human soul and spirit. And it was just obvious to, to ancient peoples. And Jonas points out that in the modern period in, um, you know, after the scientific revolution in Europe, there was this new view of the universe as a kind of machine. And so the world was de-animated and you might say the human ego was over animated and rather than what is death being the orienting question in this new mechanistic image of the cosmos the question becomes what is life because it seemed that you know as a more or less materialistic um mechanistic form of science uh, continued to explain things that um were mysterious for earlier societies, um, it seemed that the living world somehow didn't fit, was some kind of anomaly in an otherwise uh, mechanistic universe that could be explained in terms of um, the external relations among separate parts, right? And this question, what is life, uh, comes to a head in Immanuel Kant's um, uh, um, critique of judgment, which I discuss in my book where, you know, while he thinks that the entirety of the physical world can be understood according to these mechanistic categories, there's something about the living world, and he famously says, even a single blade of grass that um, cannot be explained according to these mechanistic principles, because there's a kind of circular causality. He uses the term self-organization, uh, the German equivalent, um, to talk about this way in which with living organisms, the cause is internal to, to the effect. There seems to be um, 
evidence of formal and final causality, right? Um, a, a purposiveness is is expressing itself in the living world. And for Kant, um, that that in a way is a crack in in his whole scheme of um, how mechanistic categories could explain and determine for the human mind everything in the physical world, at least the phenomenal world. Um, there was like a crack, you could say, shining that light could shine through from this noumenal realm um, in every organism. Like right? every organism represented a crack in this, um, in the phenomenal um, screen that otherwise separated us from things in themselves. And so Kant would say it was almost like an idea was at work in in an organism to give it this life. Um, and that became the kind of springboard for the German idealists and you know, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and so on, to develop a philosophy of nature that was more organic. And of course, you know, Whitehead, I see as in that lineage. Um, and so, you know, the question, what is life, if we try to ask it in as scientific a way as we possibly can, I think it does force us to consider, um, in order to avoid a dualism uh, between you know, matter and some kind of vital force that organizes matter. I think we have to go towards something um, like like pan experientialism, um, which is like the white Hedian uh, flavor of what is more popularly known as panpsychism. Uh, that there is some kind of intrinsically experiential um, aspect to uh, everything, all the way down in in the natural world, and so. Some and, and Jonas Hans Jonas himself, um, who was influenced by Whitehead, nonetheless worries that in this kind of pan experiential cosmos, um, you know, we might have an answer to what is life, but he wonders where death finds its place. Because if everything is in some sense already alive, is there any such thing as death? And he thinks that a, a pan experientialist approach um, is too happy a picture as it were and doesn't force us to confront this and and Jonas is a kind of Heideggerian here um he did, he he worries that this white headian approach sidesteps um our being towards death and our sense of um the need to confront that to really understand the meaning of human existence and you know there are various ways to respond to that criticism i think it's a it's a valid point to raise uh, but, you know, if anyone has studied Whitehead, they'll know that, you know, he has this notion of perpetual perishing. And in some sense, um, far from death being absent in his ontology, it's present in every moment of our experience. We're constantly dying to the past. And then, of course, you know, there's the rebirth uh, of a new present that inherits that past. Um, you know, Whitehead will talk about the objective immortality of every moment of our experience as it arises and perishes it remains objectively immortal nothing is lost it will it will have some effect on the future um but you know that's getting a bit into the weeds in whitehead's philosophy maybe we'll, we'll go there uh eventually but um to turn to your your other question um sacred secularity that kind of stems from this comment that Whitehead makes in Process and Reality, where he says that um, one of the most important tasks of contemporary philosophy is to secular is to secularize the concept of God's functions in the world, to secularize the, the concept of God's functions in the world. And what he means by that is that uh, when he engages in his speculative philosophical adventure when he attempts to do metaphysics to justify what natural science has discovered and to integrate the findings of natural science with the rest of human experience including religious experience he he finds it impossible to do without some kind of god concept um he doesn't want his concept of god though to be uh primarily the product of religious emotion it might have that effect on our religious it might have a uh, we might have a religious emotional response to it secondarily but for whitehead it's it's really a metaphysical um, um category that he thinks does important work for 
even for natural science and for physics to understand the sources of order in the universe. Um, but when it does come to the sort of sociological effects of or function of God, I think, you know, there's plenty of work on this coming out of like Durkheim and, and others that there is some sense in which whether we call it God or something else that that human beings to organize into communities must in some ways relate to to a, to a sacred dimension uh, of life, um, you know, in in a modern secular democratic state, you know, what replaces God is something like um, human rights or or freedom. Um, and, you know, we might then want to scratch the surface on that a little bit and see what 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 is what are human rights grounded in, you know, and um, even the famous liberal philosopher, John Rawls, you know, ultimately, um, you know, had to resort to some form of natural law rooted in a kind of theological tradition to say that, well, this is where human rights come from. And he had all sorts of thought experiments to, 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 to get there without referring to that. But, um, you know, I, I can point people to where, where he, he makes these comments if, if they're curious, but, you know, even this famous liberal philosopher ultimately has to ground the idea of human rights in some kind of a, a God concept, right. Uh, or some kind of theological concept. And so I think, these ideas of like political theology um, and the ways that modern secular societies are just sort of um, translating what had been terms and ideas drenched in theology into a secular form that nonetheless function in the same way um, that, you know, we should be more honest and open about that and find ways to engage in um, discourse about the sacred and discourse even about um, God or the divine or um, spirit or Buddha nature, however, you know, there's different ways of, of culturally um, giving expression to this mystery. Um, but I think if, if we're going to be honest about how human societies function and about what's required to kind of metaphysically ground natural science, we can't really escape theology. And, um, you know, that's part of what I mean by, you know, a, a sacred secularity. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly in agreement, Matt, although, uh, if, if you don't mind, I, and certainly I'll, I will get into more of the metaphysics and the ontology of your work, but a bit of a political question. Uh, the moment I read that part in the epilogue, my, 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 I was being a bit circumspect. In general, I tend to be a bit circumspect when it comes to this feeling of religiosity. Um, and this is mostly work, reading the works of Zizek, uh, his works in regards to ideology. And, you know, he says the, the, the quintessential example pro probably is Nazism and fascism, where there was this, there was like a feeling of sacredness when it came to, uh, what the Nazis did, right? Like the, the idea of blood and soul, the idea that this is like the, the fatherland is something really almost, it, it did bring upon those like religious uh, emotions or like the the religious uh, orient, it, it had the re religious orientation. So when I, when I read this part, what I was thinking was, have you kind of done a bit of thinking as to as to how this could certainly go wrong if in the sense of it could become something like Nazism or something quite evil, um, where people still uh, at a uh, a affective sense, they would still have this feeling of being a part of something bigger than th themselves or something that does evoke these religious sentiments and emotions, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, at an ethical sense, it is something that's quite, I'd say to use a moralistic term, evil. Uh, and you know, we, we don't even have to go that far to Nazism if we take contemporary, uh, you know, like the Trumpian movement uh, in your country. And, you know, here in Australia, things are fortunately, at least for now, a, a lot better. But you never know, uh, you know, as my dad, my dad used to always say, when America gets uh, uh, well, sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. So there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of influence from what's happening in the States and the rest of the Western world, at least. Uh, but sorry, forgive me for being long-winded. But my question is, have you thought about that dimension, the, uh, the, the ethical, political dimension of uh, 
the, this kind of idea of the sacredness. Well, you know, I wish uh, America would would cover its mouth and nose more when it sneezes. So I apologize <laughs> about that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I definitely do think a lot about this. And, you know, to be fair, like, there's a similar mm, um, ideology and the dangers of ideological fixation go beyond just religion, obviously. I mean, communist totalitarianism in the 20th century, I think, functioned despite the um, materialistic uh, orientation, I think in terms of, again, the social effects of um, Stalinism, um, Maoism, and so on, there was a sort of religiosity to it, you know? Um, and so this is a danger that we face, whether or not we are atheist materialists or um, spiritual in some way. And I think what I would, the point of leverage here that I would want to draw on is, is that if, if we do want to restore some sense of um, religiosity or spirituality in a secular democratic context, um, it needs to be a form of religion or spirituality that is that is universalistic in its intent um, and in its um, orientation, which is to say, you know, in Nazi Germany, uh, you know, of course, there were um, Catholics in, in Germany and, and a, a sense in which even up to the level of the Pope that there was at least denial, if not outright support for what Nazis were doing. But um, the Nazis themselves themselves seemed more into various pagan streams of thought and were resurrecting this old German sense of Wotan. And, and it was more of this blood and soil thing, um, which is a more tr kind of tribal nationalistic um, uh, kind of a sense of the sacred. And I think the world religions, whether that's, you know, Christianity or Buddhism or um, Islam and Judaism, well, I shouldn't say Judaism. That's not a world religion. Um, you can, I mean, this is complicated, but there are, I think, distinctions that can be made between those religions that don't require some kind of um, ethnic um, or national affiliation, but that can, that are, are um, transnational um, and that, you know, aren't rooted in or, or stuck in any any kind of um, particular location on the planet uh, or particular race or something like that. Um, and so there are though examples of these sort of universalistic religions um, that stem from Europe and, and Asia. And I think um, that's the direction I'd want to lead. And I think that uh, <sighs> I'm a committed pluralist when it comes to, you know, inter-religious dialogue, and also um, I even would say intra-religious dialogue, which is to say um, I am in dialogue with myself uh, internally about the extent to which, you know, I feel called to Buddhism or I feel called uh, to um, Christianity, or I feel um, like I have something to learn from all, all of the world religions, right? There's an internal dialogue that I engage in where I would want to claim multiple religious affiliations and identities, you know, um, and also be in constant dialogue with those who claim other identities or combinations of, of religious uh, identity or affiliation. Because, you know, it's not just a matter of wanting to make room for the differences of others, but wanting through encounter with difference to be continually transformed myself. Um, and that kind of attitude towards pluralism without and within seems to me to be part of what it would mean to do spirituality or religion in a secular democratic context, right? And so um, in the US, there's a growing Christian nationalist movement, which to my mind, I understand it sociologically and why certain people seem drawn to that particular combination of otherwise, in my mind, totally opposed ideas. Um, 
nationalism and and the teachings of Jesus Christ just don't go together in my mind. Um, they're in deep fundamental conflict. But you know, in the United States, a lot of a lot of weird things happen, <laughs> a lot of weird mixing and matching and um, cultural phenomena that you wouldn't otherwise expect if you had any knowledge of history uh, emerge and claim um, that they have some historical precedence. And so, how do we? How do I, as an American, you know, resist and confront and critique that sort of a movement, like um, a Christian nationalist movement? Um, I try to speak as someone who feels an, um, who feels, you know, drawn to the teachings of Jesus and the um, aspects of the of the tradition of Christianity. Though I myself am, I'm kind of non-denominational. Like I don't belong to a particular church or anything. Um, I try to resist it from the inside, as it were, and point out the hypocrisy of those who would want to claim to be Christian while um, being xenophobic and and racist and um, and violent. Um, I think the political sphere and the sphere of um, spirituality are not ever fully separable. I think you know, in terms of institutions, yes, church and state should be separate. But in terms of how these these two um, facets of human existence coexist within each of us, I don't think we can really claim that you know politics and religion are are finally separable. But you know, I think there is something about again our respect for human rights and the freedom of of individuals um, that. Uh, from my point of view, can only have a kind of spiritual source or spiritual grounding. Um, but that doesn't need to be, th there's no um, monopoly on, on that kind of spiritual justification by any particular religious tradition, right? I think you can, you can justify the idea of human rights um, by pointing to the Imago Dei doctrine that, you know, we are created in the image of God, or you could point to this Buddhist notion, uh, Tathagata Garbha, which is that, you know, each human being has the potential to become a Buddha, right? And that that, that potentiality is sacred, must be protected, um, so that each of us can grow into that, um, right? And so there are different ways across religious traditions of, um, of grounding what are otherwise usually thought of as secular ideals in this sort of spiritual way. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely something I think about, I've published and written about this as well, um, trying to confront Carl Schmitt and his, the Nazi jurist and philosopher and his political theology to try to mm, respond to him from a process theological point of view and to defend a kind of, um, you know, I can't deny the extent to, even that, though I have criticisms of liberal political philosophy for various reasons, I can't deny that, you know, even despite myself, I often, um, my instincts are uh, liberal, you know, in the broad sense, because I was born and raised in, in the US in a, um, a progressive context. And, um, you know, so that's just my default as it were, but I'm, um, trying to broaden our sense of what we usually mean by liberalism so that it's not merely secular but acknowledges the spiritual roots of um, this desire to protect human rights and, and human freedom oh um, yeah yeah in, in fact uh, just a side comment when you were talking about these quote-unquote unholy alliances uh, you know for instance uh, more like the american conservative branding which is like uh, christianity and capitalism which in my view they don't go hand in hand at all uh, in fact a lot of the socialist philosophers or activists that i respect they they are socialists because they're christians uh and i find i find that to be quite interesting especially since kind of the reagan thatcher that era how uh, being a conservative means you're more of a capitalist than even a christian in some sense uh, and then, of course, as you said, uh, nationalism. Uh, Matt, I, I do want to ask you this, though. Um, and in this, in this, really, do why I do really uh, respect and appreciate your work because my concern has always been, and in this sense, I guess I'm somewhat of an Enlightenment thinker, and I do uh, admire 
and 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 I'm grateful, let's say, for the enlightenment because as much as I do wanna, I do see uh, the, the virtue and the value, uh, even even at a purely pragmatic level for religion and and spirituality and whatnot. I find, for instance, so much of what you said, it's it's re religiosity or, or spirituality hampered by reason. And I'm reading this book. It's very systematic. It's well well argued. It's it's not it's not mystical in any sense. But a lot of this book is on God, on on spirituality, on religion. So I'm wondering. I I, I don't know. Perhaps I'm a, I'm a lot more cynical than you are because I'm wondering if we truly can kind of find this synthesis between being having a a a, a religious spiritual orientation or attitude but also being a, let's say, analytical, somewhat skeptical, uh, critical thinker that we saw from like the Enlightenment. Um, because my whole, uh, sorry, again, forgive me for, for being a bit too long-winded. Uh, I, I do like where Zizek talks about the Kierkegaardian notion that uh, the way we become a Christian, it's not that we you know, sit on an armchair and then we pick out, okay, there's Judaism, there's Islam, there's Christianity, Buddhism. And then it's kind of like where where re religion shopping, you know, we just go and pick whatever religion we want, but it's rather we justify a uh, post hoc, as in we, we, we find arguments for God only once we are a Christian in some sense. So my, my question is what do you, do you think uh, a, at some level it's possible for us to find this synthesis between this attitude of, uh, religiosity and spirituality, which I do believe that we need as human beings, it's, it's fundamental to our to our being, to our character, to our existence. While also, let's say, hampering it with good old enlightenment reason. Hmm. Well, you know, God is a mystery, um, and I think reason is a powerful instrument and there are some who exercise reason as though it were um as though the whole as though it were a hammer and the whole of the world were nails and the problem is um reason cannot explain everything cannot vanquish mystery. Um, science, again, another powerful method that has transformed the world um, in many positive respects, and also through its technological application, um, given us the means to destroy ourselves. Um, and so I think the enlightenment is something that I would want to in inherit and do inherit and take seriously. Um, we, we need to be skeptical of claims made without evidence, but we also need to have a very broad uh, sense of what is meant by evidence. Um, I don't think that, for example, just because I haven't had, you know, sensory experience of something that it isn't real. I mean, contemporary physics is full of things that no one can sense uh, with their eyes or their ears or touch and feel, you know, so um, science itself has had to move beyond a, a simple um, naive sense empiricism. Um, but I think there's a certain humility that's required when one engages in, in theology. Um, which just, you know, stems from what I started out saying that God is a mystery. And even to use the word God is already probably to um, stack the deck a little bit, because obviously there are spiritual orientations, uh, spiritual traditions that don't make reference to God at all. Um, you know, Buddhism, for example, but I think we're always dealing with the limitations of our cultural systems of symbolization and the way in which we're trying to point at something which is beyond our capacity to finally articulate and you know one of the boons of a kind of pluralistic approach to to religion um 
both religious studies as a, as a scholar, um, but also as a practitioner, um, is that, you know, through this pluralistic approach, it's not a, it's not a spiritual shopping mall. It's a, it's a means of triangulating between different lineages and their response to this mystery and trying to see um, in what ways this, this triangulation might reveal to us the contours of the underlying mystery that these different cultures are responding to. And so, um, you know, I do, while I have this internal diversity in my own sense of religious orientation, I do, as, as you pointed out, um, find myself um, most oriented by uh, Christianity and particularly this central symbol and event, even of the incarnation. And so, you know, when I think about what the incarnation means, it's another way of thinking about uh, the secularization of, of God. God enters into the world, becomes human and dies like everybody else, every other human being. Um, and in some ways, you know, and some scholars have argued this, uh, historians of religion, historians of modernity and the enlightenment, that the enlightenment, enlightenment secularity is it, it itself an expression of, um, of Christianity. And this emphasis on individual freedom and the importance of human rights that, you know, this is all, this emerges in, um, in modern Europe for a reason because of the, the, the influence of um, Christianity. And when I try to be, when I, when I engage in this pluralistic method and I look, say, to Buddhism, um, which would be my other kind of main source of, of orientation, kind of Mahayana Buddhism, there's this understanding of um, the Bodhisattva's vow, right? That the pursuit of um, enlightenment or the a different kind of enlightenment in the in the buddhist sense um of escaping samsara and achieving this um release into nirvana um that that's not the end of the journey there's this return to the world as the bodhisattva to liberate everybody else from suffering um and i think that is a kind of parallel to what Christianity tries to get at with its, you know, central mystery of the incarnation, right? There's this, this sense in which um, there's, there's no escape, um, even for God, or even for Buddha, that, that we're all in this together. And that in some sense, the, the sacred, and the worldly need to become fused uh, for this, this human adventure uh, to continue, um, at least to continue in a, um, in a fulfilling, enjoyable, enriching, uh, way. Um, so yeah, but I, you know, I certainly think of myself as someone who wants to inherit the enlightenment, but I'm also, um, an inheritor of romanticism and the kind of romantic response to the enlightenment sometimes you know, whitehead has a chapter in science in the modern world called the romantic reaction and unfortunately some of the romantics did become reactionaries in their old age even though when they were younger they were totally all about like celebrating the french revolution um and you know whether people i guess there's a theory that people naturally become more conservative as, as they age i don't know if that's always it's obviously not always true um, but I don't want to, I wouldn't want to identify as a, as a reactionary in, um, in finding what the romantics were doing, uh, of value. I think romanticism is though just as important as a kind of counterbalance to the enlightenment. Um, and I want to inherit both of those because I think what the romantics point out is that, you know, feeling and emotion and the aesthetic dimension of life, the imagination, um, are, are just as important, um, even if our values are for freedom, uh, to establish freedom, um, and individual expression, um, that, that these romantic, um, faculties and powers are just as important as, 
the sense of empiricism and the skepticism and the rationality that that enlightenment thinkers would champion. We need both because enlightenment reason can go overboard. Um, you know, in the ways that the French revolutionaries tried to recreate these um, a new kind of society from scratch, a new calendar, and and just getting rid of these these old religious ideas and stuff. It didn't it didn't work very well. It, it it led to a kind of to the reign of terror. I mean, you know, where we we it became clear that we can't just uproot ourselves and attempt to to replant. Um, the human being and even human reason in totally new soil that would be barren and devoid of any sort of um, religious inheritance and tradition. Reason itself is historical, right? Which is, a, you know, quick little pithy way of summarizing Hegel's big discovery. <laughs> um, and so you can't just uproot it. You wouldn't have reason as the enlightenment wants to celebrate it without this whole history of, of, a, of a religion of revelation, right? Um, and I mean, there's a whole complicated argument and dialectic there that um, Zizek, I think, is well aware of. I appreciate um, his work on this and his attempt to articulate a kind of a biblical atheism, as it were, you know, drawing on Jesus's own own words, um, feeling forsaken on the cross um, just before dying, and the em emphasis on um, the spirit of the early Christian communities as something that um, contemporary Marxists might want to recover and learn from. I, I think Zizek is um, doing some of this work for us, and 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 I, I you know I'm I don't know that I'm on board with everything that he would put forward. But um, like, for example, I know he's very critical of the effect of Buddhism on modern Western culture. Yeah. Um, I, I understand his criticisms, but I don't think it's the whole story. Um, so anyways, yeah, I appreciate that you're bringing him in. But that's kind of how I orient towards this, this question of the legacy of the Enlightenment. Now, for sure. And also just on the point of Buddhism, uh, in fact, Jack, I believe even in his, you know, less than nothing, his magnum opus, this book is becoming like my Bible because I go through it all the time. Uh, he does, does put the caveat, let's say, that it's Western Buddhism. So he's always careful to say that he's not trying to, uh, you know, critique any kind of, let's let's call it, quote unquote, authentic Buddhism, although that's a problematic term even for him. Uh, but he is looking at it more through the political lens of Western Buddhism. Uh, but Matt, this is a perfect segue because I really, the more I was reading your work, um, I was thinking of Peter Rollins and his work uh, of apophatic theology, uh, pyrotheology, as he calls it, which is heavily influenced by, you know, Lacan, Zizek, Hegel, um, and especially, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the way you described kind of the Whiteheadian, Schellingian god not as this, you know, unmoved mover who just from high above the transcendental deity who just looks at us creatures suffering and in pain, but rather it's a it's a goal that's becoming a goal that's suffering with us, a, a goal that in some sense needs us as much as we need him, uh, if I could put a gender term on it. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, again, I would love to see your work more in dialogue with the work of Peter Rollins and his work of pyrotheology. But mm. firstly, just in general, are you familiar with uh, Peter Rollins and his work? Uh, and and if and if not, maybe speaking more broadly, what are your views on apathetic theology or this theology inspired by uh, the death of God, especially the death of uh, God on, on the cross? Uh, when Christ, you know, cries out, Ela, 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 Masa Bhaktami, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Just all of those themes that I'm putting out there. <laughs> what are your, what are yeah. your views on that? Um, I don't know. I haven't read Peter Rollins' work, but negative theology, apophatic theology has definitely been um, a major influence on on my thinking and not just in Schelling and Whitehead's work. Um, I, I should credit the contemporary process theologian Catherine Keller for first sort of um, displaying to me the grandeur of that tradition, you know, going back to Dionysius the Areopagite and Gregory of Nyssa and kind of um, 
radiating through as this kind of undercurrent in Catholic theology that was never quite declared heretical, but was definitely pushing at the edges um, through, you know, Nicholas of Cusa and, um, you know, uh, you can see it, um, yeah, as I said, in Schelling's approach to understanding the nature of God and that there's divine light, but there's also divine darkness. Um, and that so much of what we might want to try to say about God or how we might want to characterize God is going to be misleading. And there's the temptation to um, worship idols and what, by imagining God as the most high, you know, the, the tendency is to think of this fully transcendent creator who didn't and doesn't need the world, doesn't need creation or creatures, but can somehow exist, uh, could exist independently. And, you know, what I love about, uh, are you familiar with Catherine Keller, the process theologian? I, I only know of her because of you, because you mentioned okay. this book many times you've, in the footnotes you've uh, referenced. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's um, written a couple books on Genesis, on um, the Creatio Ex Nihilo doctrine, and um, reread the Bible, looking at the original Hebrew and looking at the, the grammar of some of these statements um, in the book of Genesis to, to show how um, rather than creation from literally nothing, that, that the original chaos, the waters, the deep, um, the tehom in Hebrew is, is not nothing, but in fact, um, she thinks there's a kind of um, palimpsest going on in Genesis that the original authors are um, in dialogue with an earlier creation myth, uh, the Babylonian creation myth involving Marduk and Tiamat, where Marduk defeats and dismembers Tiamat and then builds, creates a new world out of that, the pieces of Tiamat's body. And Tiamat and Tehom have this etymological relationship. And so, you know, there's a way in which the God of the Hebrew Bible is not creating out of nothing, but creating out of the remains of an earlier cosmic epoch, you know, to use Whitehead's terms. Um, and this is all in under, I understand this in mythic terms. This is, this is like uh, the deep subterranean structure of human language and imagination and the way in which we comport ourselves in response to something that's ultimately beyond language, right? And so that's, that's the negative theological, the import of neg negative theology. We don't want to take any of these stories literally. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're storytelling creatures. Um, and I think we find orientation amidst the mystery by engaging in these deep archetypal, um, richly symbolic stories. And Keller has a way of rereading the biblical story. She has a couple of books on the book of Revelation as well um, that shows its contemporary relevance, which you know is very interesting in the United States in the context of the popularity of like the Left Behind series. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a lot of these Christian nationalist, fundamentalist, evangelical types are also really into the book of Revelation. And so to be able to um, kind of go in there and have a, a dialogue with them on their own terms about how um, these stories can be interpreted, I think maybe of some value for persuading them that, hey, there's, there's a different possibility here. Um, but I think, you know, the, the poetry of negative theology has had a deep impact on me. Um, I think I use the phrase from Dionysius, um, luminous darkness to understand the nature of the, of the divine as this coincidence of opposites, which is what Cuso will later, like Nicholas of Cuso will later thematize. Um, and this is, you know, one of the reasons that reason can be, is, is potentially, um, well, is limited, I think, is that, you know, we have things like the principle of sufficient reason. We have things like the principle of non-contradiction and that is really important in the context of 
logical argumentation. But when it comes to the ultimate mysteries of existence, those type of rational principles, they just break down, right? Um, because you you get, and this is what Kusa w- was trying to examine in his writings, um, the way that opposites coincide when you're engaging in this deep um, metaphysical exploration. Um, and, you know, Whitehead in Science in the Modern World, again, he has a chapter on God, which is the first time in his career that he publishes anything on theology or mentions God at all. So this is 1925, uh, chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 10 of Science in the Modern World, t- titled God. He says that, you look, God for him is a principle of limitation or a principle of concretion, he calls it. Um, but that this principle is the ultimate irrationality because no reason can be given for the ground of rationality itself, right? So why, why should there be reason and rationality? What is the origins of this? If you want to just think of it as a human capacity or, and not give it a cosmic ground, um, Whitehead posits God as a principle of limitation on infinite possibility as the ground of the groundless ground, we might say, as Schelling might say, for reason itself, right? And so there's a mystery underlying even our capacity for rationality. And Whitehead is not afraid to admit, look, I know this is the this is irrational, right? But in, if we want to go beneath reason, if we want to understand the conditions for the possibility of reason itself, what other sorts of where else can we go but to these mystical theological sorts of statements? Yeah, because what I see from your Whiteheadian work, Matt, is that um, in contrast to, let's say, Peter Rollins or even Jack, kind of the apophatic theology, it seems so much of their theology is focused on negativity and make probably makes sense given their Hegelians, the, 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 the negative aspects of God or like the self-divided God. Whereas I do see, uh, and it's in, in, in many ways, you know, in like our kind of like postmodern kind of culture, this is a breath of fresh air that Whitehead, he, in fact, he has, he asserts, he, he puts forward a positive philosophy uh, through uh, especially the ideas of like uh, creativity and imagination, which is a big, big thing for you. So, uh, well, w- what really is that kind of positive orientation in Whiteheadian uh, process theology, would you say? in contrast to more of the kind of the negative apophatic theology that we hear more from the, the Zizekians uh, in, in our times. Hmm. I think, you know, it's very, I don't know if this is intentional on your part or if you know much about Schelling's positive philosophy, uh, which was his late philosophical contribution at, uni- at the University of Berlin after, Schell- after Hegel's death, where, and it, you know, this connects to, process theology and Whitehead's work as well, where Schelling basically looked back at his own earlier work and the work of Hegel and criticized it as um, a form of negative philosophy, which was merely conceptual. And if it were to have been more upfront about the fact that it's merely conceptual, um, it wouldn't be a problem. But he thinks, you know, he's very critical in particular of Hegel's attempt to transition from the logic to the philosophy of nature, where there's, there's this sense in which the logic just freely releases itself into actual existence. And, you know, Schelling just didn't see how one could make that transition from um, the process of uh, negation by which this um, dialectical logic could unfold to actual positive existence. And, um, you know, Kierkegaard was at Schelling's late lectures and many of Kierkegaard's critiques of Hegel come straight out of, of Schelling's late criticisms. And what, what Schelling wanted to offer um, as a remedy to this situation, because he admitted his own earlier philosophy was also a negative philosophy in the sense that it, you know, was, um, relying too much on 
concept the conceptual activity of negation um, in an attempt to derive actual knowledge, where what Schelling wanted to seek in his late philosophy was uh, a more existential relationship to actual existence and to he he called it a kind of metaphysical empiricism, where we're not so much concerned with what the structure the conceptual structure of reality is we're more concerned with the fact that anything exists at all um and you know he says that the fact that anything exists at all cannot be explained rationally would be his claim that there's something unprethinkable or unapriorable about um just the the sheer fact of existence and so, I mean, I think we can safely say that existentialism is kind of born in, in these late lectures of Schelling's. Um, and, you know, he also frames this as a kind of um, uh, critique of feeling, um, Schelling does. And he, he says, he makes this interesting comment, I think I mentioned it in my book, um, about how, yeah, Kant tried to do in his third critique, this examination, a transcendental um, uh, examination of, of feeling and aesthesis and so on. Um, but, you know, he didn't follow through fully and it, he discovered things in that final critique of judgment, as I said earlier, about the living world, but also about aesthetics and our relationship to the sublime and so on that in many ways um, undermined some of the systematic claims he made in his first critique. Um, and so, you know, Schelling just drops this hint about that we still need a critique of feeling. And Whitehead later in Process and Reality, I don't, I'm pretty sure, almost certain he didn't read these late lectures of Schelling's. I know he had read at least some excerpts of Schelling's in a book by a Russian philosopher um, named Lasky. So he was aware of Schelling, but he almost certainly didn't read these late lectures on positive philosophy. But Whitehead says, again, in response to Kant, um, that he wants to replace this critique of pure reason with a critique of pure feeling. And his whole process philosophy is an attempt uh, to do so. And he also says, you know, in the first critique of pure reason, Kant has these 20 pages on the transcendental aesthetic, where he, you know, art articulates his view of space and time as forms of our own intuition. And Whitehead says, um, his whole book should have been about that and not just this quick little 20 page aside. Um, you mentioned yeah, I just, crossing, crossing the threshold. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and then basically Whitehead's philosophy of organism in the final interpretation ends up being a lot like absolute idealism um, in terms of the relationship between God and the world and the human, human self-consciousness and and the divine, but he, as he himself puts it, puts he, he he's putting philosophy on a realistic basis instead of an idealistic basis, because he's not doing philosophy uh, in an attempt to build up this hierarchy of categories of thought. He says, but rather a hierarchy of feeling, and wants to root our our all of our human knowing thinking activity and our our knowledge in a kind of um, I think of him as basically saying that knowledge itself is a form of feeling um, our conceptual activity conceptual prehension in his terms is a form of feeling just we're feeling possibilities rather than feeling actualities and so he wants to put reason and mind back in the world back in the body uh, and put the body back in the context of a living universe and so in this context, you know, positive philosophy is, um, is another way of thinking about this recharged form of empiricism. Um, Schelling called it metaphysical empiricism. William James, very influential for Whitehead, called it radical empiricism, um, where it's not that Whitehead wasn't aware of the importance of negation in the context of logical dialectics, but um he he accepts this pragmatist critique of idealistic philosophy 
and really wants our concepts to be um, adequate to experience and applicable to experience and yeah, pragmatically useful. And like the, the test of any concept for Whitehead is well, what to what extent does it elucidate our experience, including our practical experience? Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that gets at this question of the shift from the negative to the positive. Most certainly does, most certainly does. And in fact, just to answer your question, uh, Matt, whether I'm aware of uh, Schelling's late lectures, the, the answer is no, because my uh, only education of Schelling is from Frederick Beiser and this great guy on the internet called Footnotes to Plato. So, <laughs> so I need to, uh, I probably need to, what, do you know what those lectures are called? I just, I just, are they just called Schelling's late lectures or? Um, the I grounding would, of positive philosophy. I mean, so philosophy. only, only, of, only some of those lectures have been translated up to this point into English. Um, I don't know if you read German. Um, I know I don't. I don't. I I'm don't. working on it, but I don't. I don't yet uh, have the ability to really study the original. Um, but SUNY, the State University of New York, has published a lot of Schelling's late lectures, um, and under the title "The Grounding of Positive Philosophy." Uh, Bruce Matthews is the translator. They've also, SUNY has published um, some of his philosophy of mythology. Um, I think it's under the title, The Historical Critical Introduction to the Philosophy of Mythology. Um, and so that's what's available in English at this point. Yeah, and these these were all lectures he gave in Ber the University of Berlin beginning in 1841, I believe. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. If I could find that I'll leave a link down below in the description. Um, so now that we've discussed uh, God, the other big part of your uh, philosophy or your work is nature. And I would love to chat a bit more on nature. Um, one realization I've come to recently, well, I mean, recently in the past couple of years is that in many ways, nature itself uh, is a category that we create. Uh, this is mostly thanks to uh, Zizek's work, that nature, as we understand it, isn't something that's just there, uh, out there that we just perceive and we understand, but rather it's a category we create. We have we, every epoch, let's say, not cosmic epoch, but let's say every generational epoch kind of redefines cool. nature uh, in some sense. And I'm coming to realize through Zizek's work uh, through certainly your work that we need philosophy needs to reinvent nature in some sense. So on that spirit, let's say, um, Matt, what is uh, Whitehead's philosophy of organism and then Schelling's, you know, nat nature philosophy, but also, and this is a bit of a mouthful, so, you know, bear with me, uh, pertaining more to your work, what is descendental aesthetic ontology? Uh, apropos nature. Hmm. So nature is, you know, an English word comes from the Latin natura, which itself was a translation of the Greek physis, which is the basis for physical in English as well. And it's definitely become apparent um, with a lot of the critical historical research of whether Zizek or I think very influential for me on this question is Bruno Latour's work. Um, this term nature in the modern period, let's say, um, is very much a construct that has been um, given definition through its opposition to society or to culture. Um, and so when we refer to nature, usually we mean everything that's not human. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we'll follow it up and say, well, yes, humans are natural too, but we're different for X, Y, Z. Um, and so the idea of nature is quite consequential for us when we try to reflect on um, the causes of the ecological crisis and how we might want to address um, the ecological crisis. Um, Latora doesn't like the term crisis either. He thinks it's too um, minimalizing and so maybe ecological catastrophe. Um, so, you know, there are other contemporary thinkers like Timothy Morton who want to have ecology without nature and like just we need to stop using the word because it's so misleading and, and 
in the dualistic connotations um, that it that it carries. Um, similarly, phrases like the environment, it makes it sound like nature is something over there that we might either preserve or conserve or uh, destroy, as it were. And um, you know, Zizek's sense that uh, I love that documentary where you know he goes to um, the uh, trash dump and says like, "This is ecology." Right. Um, and we really need, in order to get a sense for um, how human beings are, not only are we part of nature, um, but we ourselves are bound up in these um, metabolic cycles such that, you know, every um, new forever chemical that we invent in some factory um, to manufacture whatever new product is going to end up not in the environment, but in our own bodies. Um, and I appreciate, I don't know if Zizek is willing to go this far, um, but I really appreciate Bruno Latour's Gifford lectures later published as Facing Gaia and his desire to shift us away from talking about nature or the environment to really taking seriously the idea of Gaia that we do inhabit a living planet um, we don't live on the planet, we live in this biosphere. Um, and Latour, though, is quite critical of those who would want to interpret Gaia as some kind of a goddess, and I fully understand why that can be a little bit, um, uh, what, new agey or something where, you know, we, we begin to imagine... Um, Gaia as like Mother Earth that cares for her creatures and whatever. And as Zizek is fond of pointing out, the history of life on Earth is is a series of catastrophes. And um, the current Anthropocene um, situation, uh, geological epoch um, that we find ourselves in, where it, where human industry um, is precipitating a mass extinction, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, is on most metrics, the sixth mass extinction event. Um, humans weren't around to cause the prior five. Um, some would argue they're actually more like the oxygen crisis isn't usually uh, about 2 billion years ago when anaerobic bacteria started releasing all this oxygen, which was quite poisonous to the life on the planet at the time. That's sometimes not included in the five mass extinctions. So the, the point is there have been many mass extinctions before asteroid impacts, super volcano eruptions have caused the prior ones. Um, and so we don't want to overly emphasize the unique evils of human industrial civilization as though everything was peace and quiet before we got here. <laughs> um, we don't want to have this naive picture of mother nature as a perfectly harmonious system or something, right? Um, I, and, and Zizek is very good on this question. I, I cheer him on when he, he goes after um, the deep ecologist or whoever might want to lend support to that tendency to imagine a harmonious nature that humans have disturbed. Um, nonetheless, we as human beings do need to you know, reimagine our relationship to nature if we hope to survive much longer. Um, and in my own work, I really do try to go back to that original Greek sense of phusis um, before this modern dualism separated mind from nature, uh, separated human beings from the natural world. I think the Greeks had this sense of phusis as um, a, a process, an activity of um, Nat of natality. I mean, you still get it in the Latin term natura. Um, it's a it's a birthing process. It's um, it's an activity wherein something is being um, given expression, and there's a a kind of um, a creativity that I think the original Greek term um, was was capturing, and this process of that you see in Aristotle's biology of a developmental telos that unfolds um, in what we now just call the physical world. And I want to, in my work, recover that, that sense of um, 
nature and the physical as something um, that is a process of growth and development and not just a collection of particles colliding or you know meaningless fields vibrating that there really is um, reason to take seriously formal and final causality um, as Aristotle referred to them um, and in my book you know you'll have noticed the whole uh, section on vegetal uh, philosophy coming out of Michael Martyr's work and so I make this connection to the plant realm to plant life as being um, a site of um, uh, what uh, ontological edification as it were that we can learn from um, the mode of life given expression by plants about um, how mind and nature relate and you know this also goes back to the etymological roots of um, fusis and and the connection to phyto you know which still has some resonance in in english relating to um plants right um and so you know i try to draw these connections and articulate a a vegetal um ontology uh martyr michael martyr likes to has written several books um going through the history of philosophy and um, showing the various ways that plant life has been um, underappreciated by philosophers. Uh, you know, Aristotle kind of said, oh, plants are barely alive. Like Hegel similarly has said that they're more like crystals than they are like living animals and, you know, proper organisms. And uh, I think Martyr tries to um, be the advocate for plants and much of contemporary botany now is discovering the ways in which um, we can speak meaningfully about plant cognition, uh, plant sentience, uh, plant memory, um, and so on that these and you know, modern um, um, videography and um, what's the term I'm looking for, we, you know, we can we can speed up, we can record and speed up the um, time lapse photography is what I'm looking for, we can see the ways that contrary to what has long been assumed, um, plants are not immobile, they are animate, they move, they, they breathe. Uh, it, it's just that they, they move at a rate that's not immediately apparent to our animal senses. Um, and so yeah, all of this to me is, is connected to an attempt to uh, reimagine what we mean by nature, I continue to use the term in my book. Uh, I capitalize it and I think I the first time I use it I have this little footnote um, just to say that you know I acknowledge what people like Timothy Morton and and Zizek and Latour and others are concerned about with the way that this concept of nature is typically deployed in the modern period but that I'm trying to um, restore this this deeper meaning um, that I think is still there in the ancient Greek term um, physis and that really captures the animate and um, living dimension of, uh, of, of nature. Yeah, uh, this probably is because of my ignorance when it comes to biology or contemporary biology. But apart from Michael Levin, uh, Matthew, do you think there are any biologists or scientists that are kind of working from this metaphysical framework that you just described? Um, Andres Weber comes to mind. Um, uh, Robert Rosen, he's not alive anymore, but um, made important contributions. Uh, I collaborate with an astrobiologist named Bruce Damer, um, who I've, we've co authored a, um, a chapter that will be out soon on the origin of life and how Whitehead's cosmology helps recontextualize the attempt to understand how life could emerge from you know matter um other biologists let me think um you know there are some marxist dialectical biologists let's call them um like richard lawton um i think he might have passed away um you know but he has 
he's written a great book um, called The Triple Helix. I think gene organism environment where he just, you know, tries to break us out of any simplistic reductionistic story about how genes operate, um, challenging the central dogma of a linear kind of relationship between DNA, RNA, and proteins, and that actually you already need proteins to not only error correct the DNA, but the ribosome to, to trans, translate and transcribe. Um, you already need protein to get that process going. And so it's a circular process. It's not a, the central dogma is wrong from Lewontin's point of view. And he's just, you know, drawing on a dialectical mode of thinking there. He's still materialist, but I think has a more, um, what, lively understanding of the agency of organisms, um, that organisms have a role to play in their own evolution and are not just passively selected by fixed environments or something. Um, I mean, anyone involved in developmental, evolutionary de developmental biology in the study of ontogeny itself as I think um, holding mysteries and many open questions that don't quite fit into the standard neo-Darwinian picture would be in, I, I hope and like to imagine in line with much of what I'm saying, um, like Susan Oyama, um, who else? Yeah, I mean, I could keep rattling names off as they come to me, but I think maybe there's plenty of, I think biology is undergoing a major um, paradigm shift right now. Oh, Lynn Margulis, of course. Um, if anyone's not familiar with the debate that she had with Richard Dawkins at Oxford in 2009, I believe, it was published as a book. And I think there's some videos of it on YouTube. It's marvelous to see um, Dawkins reductionism get put in its place by just hardcore scientific fact and argument. Um, Margulis is probably um, one of the few who could go toe to toe with with someone as uh, sharp and, and, you know, aggressive in his argumentation as Dawkins. And it was just, it's a delight to see that. Um, and Lynn Margulis was influenced by Whitehead as well. Um, Excellent. Yeah, it's coming up. I'll, I'll leave a link to all of those thinkers uh, that you mentioned to their work in the description. The reason I ask is because, uh, you know, this is a bit embarrassing, but really the only book on biology I've read is The Selfish Gene. And um, I feel very outdated. Uh, I recently, I've been following uh, Michael Levin's work. And I just, in fact, even uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, he seems, he still is very much a materialist thinker, but he is quite critical of this notion of natural selection, for instance, this idea that, you know, that we are in it for ourselves, you know, kind of uh, a selfish gene, let's call it uh, intimations. Um, so there have been a lot of thinkers that have, have been quite, um, let's say, critical of the contemporary yeah. dogma of, of biology, which is changing. David's, yeah, David Sloan Wilson is another name I should throw in there. Uh, group selection uh, theory is his thing, which is another counter to the selfish gene idea, which, you know, it's only half a century out of date at this point. So. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for that, Matt. But back to the, the more speculative philosophy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, dissidental aesthetic ontology. Um, oh, this, right. Yeah. I, I would lo love to discuss that because for me, again, um, without, I, I do believe we need a philosophy to uh, frame the world properly, regardless of which discipline. And, and how, how do we kind of, yeah, how do we understand what this means, this this framework you're putting forward? And then what can these other disciplines, be it physics or biology, gain from that conceptual framework, for lack of a better term? So I'm kind of borrowing the term from Schelling again, who in his late lectures refers to his positive philosophy is a philosophy of descendants using um, that phraseology. And I, he's countering, um, inverting as it were, Kantian transcendentalism, um, which would begin with concepts and try to derive the world. Whereas the descendental approach begins with experience and recognizes that our own thinking activity our own conceptual activity is in some sense derivative from the world of, of our 
embodied experience. Um, and this very much aligns with Whitehead's approach. Um, and rather than thinking of um, philosophy as Kant had it, uh, as the attempt to uh, uncover the transcendental conditions for the possibility of any experience, I think of descendental philosophy as a different kind of methodology that's attempting to surface the conditions of actual experience, right? And this is this relates to the difference between negative and positive philosophy. Um, sort of like the question of where we're not only where we begin, but what, what we're aiming for. Um, I do take seriously the importance of systematic thought um, in metaphysics. And yet, I also follow Whitehead in approaching speculative philosophy in a pragmatic way, um, which is to say, there, we should not delude ourselves by expecting that we might ever complete the system um, or arrive at the end, uh, achieving some kind of closure, you know, and Whitehead was as aware of any one of the danger of that temptation. Um, because with Bertrand Russell, you know, and in, in when he was still at Cambridge, um, they wrote this multi volume. Um, work in mathematical logic, the Principia Mathematica, and uncovered all sorts of paradoxes having to do with different kinds of self-reference that a few decades later, um, Kurt Gödel, you know, formally proved why they couldn't escape those paradoxes. And while Russell was, I think, um, quite frustrated, uh, almost devastated by by the failure. I mean, the Principia is both a great success and a failure in the sense that it birthed a whole new method of philosophy, analytic philosophy, and it's not clear if, you know, we'd have the sciences of computation that we do today without the work that they pioneered in that book. But it was also a failure in the sense that they did not ground mathematics in formal logic. They failed to do that. Um, but unlike Russell, who was devastated, Whitehead was liberated. Um, and pursued later in his life an approach to philosophy that was as systematic as it could be, but he wanted his systems to be open, responsive to experience, and and um, of use to people, <laughs> um, rather than metaphysics being something that uh, irritable professors would engage in and, and dispute about. He wanted it to be um, clarifying for everyday people and their attempt to make sense of their lives, but at the same time, clarifying to um, practicing scientists in an attempt to make sense of their own work and to be able to um, articulate the transdisciplinary uh, connections between the various special sciences. And so descendental is descendental philosophy is a way of approaching philosophy systematically that um, nonetheless leaves the system open, um, encourages us to continually test the categories of the system uh, in light of experience, um, and to not be afraid to amend and revise those categories. Um, you know. Whitehead's not just saying that our metaphysical categories are generalizations from particular experiences. There is a sense in which, um, you know, experience itself already comes pre-organized, as it were. You know, and so he is—he's a post-Kantian thinker in that way. Um, he's not—he's not denying. Uh, you know, he's—I don't think he's um, sort of falling for the. Uh, myth of the given or something, right? He, he recognizes that experience always comes in some ways pre-interpreted uh, by these unconscious habits of thought that we need to surface. It's just that he doesn't think, um, he, he's not approaching this challenge of the conditions of our experience in the way that Kant did by deducing a table of categories in advance of experience. Um, he thinks that we need to be in closer dialogue with experience uh, 
as did Schelling. Um, and while Schelling may have initially been a bit more idealistic in his mm, tendencies, I mean, he starts as a student of Fichte, um, trying to derive all of our experience from this uh, dialectic of concepts. I think in close dialogue with his mentor, um, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who, in addition to being a poet and a statesman, was a scientist, um, Goethe brought Schelling back to experience, back to his encounter with, with nature in, in its full concreteness, um, and, and impressed upon Schelling the importance of experiment and, you know, actually getting your hands dirty, as it were, not just with, with chalk from uh, the chalkboard you use to lecture, but getting your hands in the soil, getting your hands um, you know, engaged in experiment, because um, as Schelling would later articulate it, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's something about the actually existing world that is unprethinkable. Right? Prehensive, and, prehensive is the Whitehead's term, isn't it? Prehensive? Yeah, yeah. You could, you could draw on that too. Um, and so, yeah, Descendental is my attempt to capture the ways that Schelling and Whitehead invert the Kantian method, which just as Whitehead inverts Plato, um, where Whitehead still has his eternal objects, which are like platonic forms, but he inverts the platonic um, sense that these forms have preeminence and that the physical world of our experience is just a pale imitation of these forms. Whitehead inverts that and says, no, um, our, our actual experience is the only reason or cause and is, and is of maximal importance. And the forms that we draw on to characterize that experience are themselves deficient in actuality. In the same way, Whitehead's inverting, well, not in exactly the same way, but there's a similar inversion happening with Kant um, to bring us back in touch with experience and feeling and out of this cage of categories. Um, and so descendental seems like uh, hopefully not a, a too cute way of um, expressing that inversion from the typical Kantian transcendental approach. Now, yeah, also thank, thank you for cor correcting my pronunciation on that. It's, it's descendental. I think I said descendental or something. It doesn't matter. Uh, um, yeah. Matt, I, I've got, I, I want to be cognizant of the time. I just want to ask you one more question about, uh, uh, first of all, have you got five more minutes or? Are you, yeah, are you, we can go for five more. Yeah. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. I really appreciate that. If not, I could even email the question. Um, are you familiar with the work of Adrian Johnston? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, um, so his kind of his, philosophy his of transcendental materialism. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that that sort of thinking? Um, um, I mean, it's better than reductionistic materialism. <laughs> I think, you know, and all of these new materialisms are quite interesting um, to me. Um, you know, I've, I've only read a little bit of his work. Um, I've read more of Jane Bennett who has her own kind of, I think she calls it vital materialism. And then there's someone else is doing vibrant materialism. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not so hung up on the words, you know, we can, we can call it whatever we want. And I don't know the details enough of um, uh, Johnston's approach to his form of materialism to say where I might differ from it. Um, you know, I don't call myself an idealist or a spiritualist, so it's not like um, my criticisms of materialism are um, a result of my desire to just rush to the opposite extreme. Um, but to the extent that a thinker is dialectical, I would imagine that in conversation, um, we could very quickly move beyond the, the label that has been chosen for, for the approach. Um, I know that among progressive academics, um, that it's important to signal one's allegiance to materialism as a way of pointing to the importance of, of material conditions and, and the shifts in material conditions that are really driving social change. And um, I, I think that's important, um, even while I also believe ideas can shape history. Um, and so, yeah, 
to the extent, I don't know if, if I'm in perfect alignment uh, with it, but um, definitely would be eager uh, for that conversation to happen, to figure it out. Yeah, indeed. Because uh, the reason I asked was uh, um, um, I'll be having Professor Johnston on uh, in April this year. And I do oh, want great. to ask him about uh, descendental aesthetic ontology. So I'm trying to think of a way to formulate the question where I can cogently put forward your uh, philosophy so that I I want to I want to hear his response because I find I find similarities, but but I think a lot of Jerkins, Arian Johnston from that that school uh, they they still stick to some kind of materialism with this mm -hmm. subject object dichotomy they, they still keep it separate in, in that sense whereas i find in your work especially inspired by uh shelling and whitehead you 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 don't really uh you don't really make the stark differences be differences between the subject and the object you find it they can't speak to each other or then you know dialectics to use a pretentious term subject and object are different phases of the same process is how in, I in would... that sense yes yes mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Matt. This this meant, meant a lot to me. I've been following your work for years. And again, I was a bit starstruck at first to talk to you in person. So I'm really grateful for your time. Yeah, no, my pleasure, Raul. Thanks for the great questions. And um, yeah, let's stay in touch. Be happy to uh, do a round two at some point. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Cheers. Take care.